Ah, so uh, let me give you a bit of an introduction to microbial genomics before we actually start into the, the practical sessions of uh, today. And when we talk about microbial genomics, particularly um, in the context of uh, ancient material, so basically material that has been uh, gathered from ancient human remains, for example, or other archaeological uh, material, we are not only interested in the pathogen itself or in the evolution of um, these pathogens, but also the historical context of human disease. When I say history of human disease, I'm not only talking about a strictly historic context, but also, of course, prehistoric context. And the connection between development of uh, humans, between development of human um, societies and uh, therefore also the influence of human disease on the development of human societies and thereby the interaction between this development and the evolution of pathogens um, itself as they did actually not evolve completely disconnected but in parallel and with us adapting to our lifestyle and again, human society is also adapting or reacting to human disease. And this entanglement is actually what we would like to study when uh, focusing on human disease and evolution of human pathogens in the context of utilizing ancient material. But before we can actually uh, study these aspects, we have to find samples that fulfill the criteria so that we can actually uh, reconstruct genomes of ancient pathogens and therefore study the connections that I have just mentioned. And that is uh, a large challenge because screening human archaeological remains for uh, remains also of pathogens is actually literally like searching for the needle in the haystack as the pathogen DNA will only uh, make very small portion of the DNA that we find in a human sample. And when I'm talking about human samples, so these are in <clears throat> most cases skeletal remains. In many cases where we are looking for ancient pathogens, um, we would focus ideally on teeth as within teeth, blood-borne pathogens um, are most well preserved, but that also depends on the type of pathogen. So I will um, primarily focus on two examples today. But just uh, to give you a bit of an overview of diversity, what this means when we talk about um, preservation of ancient pathogen DNA. As I said, blood-borne pathogens such as uh, the plague will be uh, ideally found in, in teeth. Other pathogens such as tuberculosis, um, we often find in or in the context of bone lesions, such as um, with vertebrae or, or ribs. Um, and again, other pathogens such as HBV, hepatitis B virus, we actually have found in all kinds of skeletal remains, even in the petrous portion. Um, and, therefore, uh, and therefore, we have to keep in mind that some pathogens will preserve in a, a higher multitude in a higher diversity of bone elements than others. In this very simple scheme here, I just put 0.1% um, pathogen DNA, but actually if you have a sample that um, has pathogen DNA and we are at the ratio of 0.1%, this is actually um, a quite good preservation. So often we find actually less than 0.1%. Uh, and um, what we actually find most in uh, ancient samples is uh, other bacterial DNA that is not originating from uh, pathogens, but actually from the soil environment, uh, for example, that the skeleton was buried in. Um, I put here 10% for host um, preservation, but this is of course completely arbitrary. So as we know, this can be far below 1%, can be, uh, be above 50%. So this is highly variable. Um, but usually we do not get very high values for pathogen preservation occasionally above 0.1%. But uh, this is rather rare. Just to mention one case, we had a leprosy sample that had a 40% uh, 
leprosy DNA. So this is quite a lot, but also extraordinary. Um, normally, we do not find that. However, we are facing um, another challenge, not only this kind of low amount and, of course, degradation of um, the DNA. So this was content of other lectures. We have DNA damage. We have degradation of DNA molecules. But we also have the challenge that many human pathogens actually evolved evolutionarily from uh, bacteria that live in the soil. Um, and as we, um, as I have pointed out in this diagram here, also a quite large amount of soil uh, DNA bacteria from the soil um, in our samples, it is actually a, a primary challenge of identifying uh, samples for pathogen reconstruction to differentiate uh, the bits of DNA that we find of the ancient pathogen from actually the, the soil background. So we have to answer a number of questions. Is the recovered DNA of ancient origin? So this has been covered in other parts of the course. Do we see the typical DNA damage patterns? Can we differentiate species? So can we answer the question, who is there? Um, what is the influence of this soil contamination and what do we actually do and how do we differentiate the fact when we have infection by multiple pathogens, maybe closely related? So I do not want to go through all of these aspects, as many of them um, have, already, uh, have already been covered by my colleague uh, Tina, um, but I would like to highlight the most importance of them and how we are actually, uh, how we have developed methods to get around these um, these issues. So first of all, um, a little demonstration here. I'm not sure if you have actually seen this particular plot, but I um, nevertheless want to show it because it's very central uh, to the challenges that we are facing when performing pathogen screening. So this is actually a little experiment uh, that a group of us has done just to find out what we are um, facing uh, when we want to screen material for pathogen DNA. So what we did here was basically taking three types of samples, a set of samples for each of them. So human saliva, uh, ocean, and soil. So these are just modern samples, metagenomic samples, basically the microbiomes of these, um, uh, of, of these sample types, like human saliva, ocean, and soil. And what we did here is just mapping them to pathogen genomes. So a very simple approach, we just take the, the DNA sequencing data that would come from each of these um, environmental samples and map them to one particular pathogen genome. So the ratio behind this is what would happen if you just think, okay, I want to identify, say, Yersinia pests in my samples. And now what would happen if you just take the data and map it to these particular pathogens? And what you see here is that from each of these sample types, particularly human saliva, you get um, a quite notable amount of DNA sequencing reads aligning to each of these pathogen genomes. And what you see here on the x-axis is actually an, a number of uh, pathogens that we indeed typically would look for, only a small selection. There would be more that we are interested in, but these are some of the usual Suspects, so Bacillus anthracis, for example, that is anthrax, Bordetella pertussis, this is whooping cough. We have multiple Borrelia and Brucella species um, that we would be interested in. Mycobacterium leprae, that is leprosy. Tuberculosis, we have here. Salmonella uh, typhi, that's typhoid uh, fever. Teponema pallidum, that is syphilis or yours. And then, of course, cholera and plague. Um, so very typical uh, pathogens that we would be interested in to see them in a, in a historic or prehistoric context. And you see um, that no matter which of these pathogens we would uh, look for by just mapping to a single pathogen genome, we would find all of them in all of these environmental sample types that we would consider a negative control. So I should add the human saliva data sets that we used here were from healthy humans from a control cohort of a medical study. And also um, in ocean and soil, we do not expect any of these, these pathogens really. But you see, we basically find all of them. And the reason is um, what I mentioned before, that there are close relatives of each of these human pathogens that we do find 
in the soil. So we need to take measures to actually uh, distinguish them. So we have um, multiple issues here. So we have the problem that uh, genetic, phylogenetic relationships are often not perfectly reflected in the taxonomy that we find in the databases. Databases are also quite incomplete. They are biased towards pathogenic organisms. And that means that often uh, we do not have the environmental diversity that we actually uh, find in the soil, in water, and so forth in the database. But we have a lot of pathogens in the database because this is what is being studied for medical reasons. And then, of course, we have the issue that many uh, tools that are used for alignment, um, for metagenomic assignment, and so forth, they would, of course, try to distribute your DNA sequencing data to the database, to the taxonomic tree, um, and then find these pathogen genomes that are related and that are contained in the database where the actual origin of your DNA fragments, the environmental diversity, is not fully contained. So we have a number of measures that we are looking at. I just want to point out uh, two in addition to the damage patterns that you have already learned about. Um, one of them is evenness of uh, genome coverage. This is actually not easy to identify because the coverage that we get is anyway quite uneven. But what we would want ideally is that the DNA fragments that we identify in a sample are relatively randomly distributed um, across the genome um, and do not accumulate in certain conserved regions, which then would maybe indicate that we have rather identified a close relative to the pathogen that we are looking for. Um, and similarly, we look at percent identity, or uh, often we call them added distance distributions, in order to distinguish foreground and background. And I will elaborate a bit on each of them. So this is just um, a scheme uh, of how reads, sequencing reads, could be distributed across uh, a whole genome of a potential um, pathogen. And I mean, what we expect is that we have a few DNA uh, sequences that basically scatter across the whole genome um, in more or less a random distribution. This is what you see here in the upper part. This is, of course, just a screen, um, a scheme. But basically, when we look at the genome browser after mapping, we can indeed identify these patterns. And we have developed also automatisms to identify them. What you see here on the bottom is what I uh, mean by accumulation in certain regions. So we have more or less an empty genome, but we have a lot of reads that accumulate in, in certain regions. And these regions are then often genes, for example, that are conserved across many species, across many bacteria. And then, of course, these regions, no matter uh, which bacterium or pathogen if they are closely related, you take for mapping, uh, it would attract all of these DNA fragments in the mapping process. Um, so that would not allow us uh, to really differentiate the species. And now the tricky bit is that these two cases that uh, are illustrated here are not necessarily uh, easy to distinguish if you just look at the number of uh, mapping reads, because if you have, um, let's say, 100 or 1,000 reads that um, scatter all across the genome would be good. But if you have a 1,000 that just accumulate in certain highly conserved regions, that doesn't tell you anything. So that's why we really look, uh, look a bit closer into the distribution of uh, these reads. So the second aspect is looking at um, percent identity distributions or edit distance distributions, which is in a way equivalent so we are basically asking the questions, how similar are the sequences, the DNA sequences of the fragments that we find in our sample and that we have assigned to a certain pathogen? How similar are they to this genome? And what's the similarity distribution? This is actually what it is about. Um, what you see on the left side is just a schematic of how such a similarity distribution would look like roughly at least for a positive sample. So we have a foreground distribution where uh, many or even most of um, the fragments would have a high similarity and then this decreases. And then we might have a certain level of background 
of rather dissimilar sequences that have also been assigned to the pathogen, likely due to the reasons that I have mentioned before, because there is just no representative of the actual species in the database where these fragments um, originate from. If you have a, a negative sample, um, we see often distributions as you see them here on the right side. So the majority of DNA fragments is quite dissimilar. And then we have a decreasing amount of DNA fragments that are similar to the pathogen that we are actually looking for. So there are, um, is a couple of other questions that we have to answer, but I'm uh, not elaborating on them because that have, has been part of other uh, lectures. So we have to answer in addition to the question, do we actually have ancient DNA? Um, we look at the damage patterns that you have learned about. We have to ask who is there. So can we actually differentiate all of the species on a metagenomic level um, that we have in our sample? Um, and that comes with database biases, that comes with the issue that taxonomy uh, does not really match the phylogeny. And um, we have already talked about now about the close environmental relatives that we have to distinguish. Um, there are tools out there for actually performing those kind of uh, differentiation. And I just want to give you a short overview, a bit of advertisement for the tool that we have developed on uh, our site. And that is called HOPS for Heuristic Operations for Pathogen Screening. This tool is actually based on the uh, alignment tool MALT. And MALT performs a DNA sequence alignment to a large database. So these, la uh, these database can be customly uh, created, for example, by representative sequences of all bacteria that you can get from uh, NCBI. It also has the NCBI uh, taxonomy tree included. And what it basically does is not only alignment to the full database, but it also performs uh, a taxonomic assignment. Taxonomic classification is basically what you have um, also already heard about. But here we are particularly interested in um, having that highly specific for, for species. So we are in the pathogen screening context, not necessarily interested in the full microbiome characterization of the sample, but rather finding out are certain pathogenic species contained in the sample or not. So what MOL does is actually for each aligned read also such a specificity assessment, one could say. So it basically tells you <clears throat> how specific a read is for a certain taxonomic level. So if it is really specific enough to identify a species, it would be assigned on species level. Uh, it would be assigned on, on genus level if it matches multiple species and so forth. So it uh, relies on the so-called lowest common ancestor algorithm, assigning each read to the lowest common ancestor in the taxonomic tree. We have um, then further developed malt extract, which is basically um, uh, taking the malt output and performing a number of authenticity assessments, some of which I have introduced before. And it um, performs them for a whole target species list of all kind of human pathogens that we are potentially interested in. And each of them is evaluated for a range of authenticity criteria. And that gives us then a detailed a candidate list for potentially uh, positive samples where we can find human pathogens. In. When we have identified the, the samples, we can perform the targeted DNA capture for a number of organisms where we have a capture assay ready in order to reconstruct full genomes. So what we will um, actually work on the practical sessions of today is uh, in the morning actually looking into the details of genome mapping. So comparing um, DNA sequencing reads to a reference genome. In the uh, afternoon, Alex will work with you on what is called the novo assembly. So basically reconstructing genomes from scratch. Um, but I would like to evaluate, um, elaborate in this lecture now a bit on the question, what do we do with these genomes when we, when we have them? So um, coming back to the beginning of my lecture, where I already highlighted certain connections, questions, 
and research topics that we would like to address, where do we actually start with them? So what could be first questions and areas to explore when we want to study the uh, interaction between human culture and pathogen um, evolution? And here um, we selected actually for a number of projects that we are working on the, the time and geographic range of what is often called the Neolithic revolution or the Neolithization process in Eurasia. So basically the transition from um, a rather uh, nomadic hunter-gathering lifestyle to a more sedentary lifestyle, often still nomadic, but a transition also from uh, subsistence strategies of hunter-gathering to uh, pastoralism, keeping livestock, agriculture, and so forth. So this was um, a quite strong shift in uh, elements of human lifestyle, meaning that the groups of people living together uh, became bigger, but also the density of people living together became higher. People were living more closely together and also more closely to their livestock or actually having a, a change towards livestock in the first place. And this created basically a whole new niche for pathogens to develop. And our assumption is, and that is a common hypothesis in the field, that this particularly created a niche for so-called zoonotic events, so for pathogens uh, spreading from animals to humans, but in that context, not only as singular or regular events, but um, the hypothesis is that this also created a niche where pathogens could then also adapt even specifically to the human host. So in, um, in the first study that we actually performed on such material, we screened almost 3,000 data sets that would relate to the time period and the geographic uh, region of the Neolithization process in Eurasia. And one hit, one candidate hit that we often found in this, um, in this data set was Salmonella enterica. Salmonella enterica is a bacterium that infects humans often through contaminated food causing salmonellosis. That's actually quite a common food poisoning uh, agent. Um, and we have a high number of uh, also environmental isolates. So there are uh, different so-called serovars of this bacterium, some um, being usually found in contaminated food, but many, many more that will just be found in the environment, completely apathogenic also. But there are also rather host-specific serovars, um, some of which specific for certain animal species, but some also specific uh, to the human host. And these are um, Salmonella typhi and Paratyphi A, B, and C. And uh, these bacteria cause typhoid or paratyphoid fever. So a systemic disease rather than just a gastrointestinal infection. We have been able to reconstruct uh, genomes actually not only from uh, various places and various time periods in uh, Eurasia, in the oldest samples being uh, more than 6,000 uh, years old, but we were also um, able to reconstruct genomes from uh, uh, an epidemic burial in colonial uh, Mexico from the 16th century, and colleagues of us were able to reconstruct uh, a genome from medieval Northern Europe from the uh, 13th century. So we have actually quite uh, a time range of Salmonella enterica genomes from ancient uh, time periods. But you see um, also from, from other areas and other time periods, multiple millennia that we can now actually cover with these genomes. So if we have a look at the whole full diversity of S. enterica as we know it today, um, we see here a rather zoomed out version. So the phylogenetic tree that you see here contains the full diversity of Salmonella enterica, uh, subspecies enterica, I should say, and all its serovars as we uh, know it today. 
And you see at the bottom, uh, Salmonella typhi and Paratyphi uh, A. Um, and Salmonella typhi is actually the uh, bacterium causing typhoid fever and one of the, the primary causative agents of systemic disease from the Salmonella enterica species. You see here a lot of uh, strains that are shown in blue, many in black. What you see in black has actually not been precisely characterized. What you see in blue are many, uh, many reservoirs that are host unrestricted that can infect um, multiple species. And the most part of the diversity of this tree are actually uh, environmental isolates also that would not necessarily cause any disease at all. Where do we now find uh, all the ancient genomes? And this is what uh, we find in the part of the tree that is highlighted here in red. This is a quite large and diverse branch of Salmonella enterica, but all of the ancient genomes that we have identified um, so far fall into this branch and not in the other part of the diversity that we see here. So we are now zooming into this branch. Um, and what we see here is uh, actually the phylogenetic tree of all of the ancient genomes shown in uh, red of all um, pathogenic as enterica species as we know them from today uh, shown in orange and indicated uh, next to these strains the host specificity. So you can, for example, see that we have here in this tree um, Salmonella enterica that is specialized on sheep that has been found in sea mammals or horses. And what you see on the uh, at the top here is actually a type of Salmonella enterica that is called Paratyphi C and that is uh, specific to humans um, and also other parts that are uh, other strains that are closely related such as Typhi Suez, which is um, specific for pigs and um, a type that is called cholera sewers that is actually infecting both humans and pigs. Um, and what you see here next to the red indicated samples, so next to the ancient samples, is also the, the age of the samples. And we see that the oldest ones in the, in the bottom of the tree fall actually quite ancestral within this branch. And what these figures indicate that we put next to them is actually that these oldest strains uh, are actually originating from uh, a population that had primarily a hunter-gathering lifestyle still. When we look at um, all the samples that originate from populations with the pastoralist lifestyle, we actually find them in the more derived upper part of the tree. And if we zoom in again, <clears throat> we see actually that uh, the older ones, more than um, around uh, 5,000 years old, um, or even more than three, 4,000 years old, will uh, actually fall ancestral to um, a lineage that's called Paracy and that I introduced earlier. So these are these three uh, orange clades on the top, consisting of human and pig infecting strains. So the significance of this is that for this type of Salmonella enterica, it has been thought that this actually originally uh, originated and evolved in pigs, particularly wild boar, and then spread to humans much later, potentially around the time of pig domestication or even during medieval time. This has been the, the hypothesis. But now we see that we find this type of Salmonella enterica uh, much earlier in human populations uh, and also in populations who were actually not uh, keeping pigs at all. So our hypothesis in this context is rather that um, these uh, earlier strains were not coming from pigs, but that potentially uh, the introduction into pigs was happening later from humans or uh, other livestock. So the next big question was for us, can we say anything about the disease ecology? And um, can we use any proxy there? Because 
obviously it is not import, uh, possible for us to study the phenotype of these Salmonella enterica strains as they existed thousands of years ago. So we cannot really know and study how they infected um, other species and which species they actually infected. But we looked at uh, one measure that basically served for us as some kind of a proxy, and that is uh, the pseudogene frequency. So what are pseudogenes and what is uh, the so-called pseudogenization process? It is a process by which genes become non-functional. For example, uh, by point mutations that result in a stop codon, uh, so actually the protein is then not produced properly anymore, um, or insertions, deletions within the gene sequence that result in a frame shift, um, and thereby often then also to a premature stop codon and also a non-functional uh, protein. And now, of course, one would wonder why is such a mutation not negatively selected? I mean, particularly bacteria have an extremely dense genome. So there is not a lot uh, of non-coding DNA. There are no introns, for example. There are uh, only rather short intergenic uh, regions. So the question is, if there is a gene that becomes non-functional, why is that not detrimental? for the bacterium and therefore uh, negatively selected. So one uh, possibility is the function is not needed anymore. And this, this would indicate a change in ecology. And this can, for example, be if uh, a, an environmental bacterium um, rather shifts to a lifestyle as a pathogen, as many genes, many gene functions that are needed in um, a soil environment, for example, or water, would not be needed anymore um, within a pathogen lifestyle. The function might even have a negative effect. So we might even find a positive selection. Why could that be? Uh, for example, many of the functions that I indicated earlier that are needed in a soil or water background, for example, um, motility, are actually cell surface proteins motility factors, flagella, for example. And these can have a negative effect if the bacterium shifts to be a pathogen, as these cell surface factors are often uh, primarily targeted by the immune system. So it is even potentially uh, an advantage to lose them. There could also be duplication effects, so one functional copy uh, is kept um, and the other copy can be lost. But what we indeed often have is a change in ecology, therefore no negative selection for losing a gene, um, or even positive selection for losing it, because it could be attacked by the immune system. So the pseudogenization is therefore in uh, functional bacterial studies that are based on genomic data, often used as a, uh, as a proxy to detect a change in ecology and uh, potentially also um, a higher specificity to a certain host, so basically as a proxy for a host adaptation process. So in order to look at that within a Salmonella enterica, we actually uh, measured the pseudogene frequency in the whole variety and diversity of Salmonella enterica that I have introduced before. And we put this here on the bar chart. So basically on the x-axis, there are all these different genomes um, of Salmonella enterica, no matter if they are environmental, if they are uh, pathogenic, but host unrestricted, or if they are quite host specific. So we have them all here and we have the pseudogene frequency on the y-axis. What is indicated here in, in red are our uh, ancient genomes. And what we see here is um, on the left side in, in bluish colors, uh, actually host unrestricted uh, salmonella. And what we see in reddish, yellowish colors to the right are uh, host restricted strains. So when I say host restricted, that means that they are often restricted to just one mammalian species, for example. Um, just to give you one example, at the very, very right in dark red, so the highest bars that we have in this chart is a serovar 
that is called Abortus Ovis, and that is actually a cerro bar that has specialized on sheep. And as you can see, we have actually the effect that um, I have mentioned before. So the more the bacterium is a rather generalist, the further we actually um, see the bacterium here on the left. So with the lower numbers of pseudogenization and the more it is specialized on a certain host, the more we see it to the right. And what we um, can see here is that our ancient genomes fall actually rather in the host unrestricted part of this plot to the left. Um, and our conclusion from this is that uh, at the time, during the time of the Neolithization process, so the late Neolithic and Bronze Age, we have actually mostly infections with Salmonella enterica that are still quite unadapted to humans. And that this adaptation process actually happened uh, later and particularly also during this time of um, a lifestyle with uh, close contact to domesticates. Meaning that um, we are actually likely seeing here a specialization process, an evolutionary process that happens uh, not within humans, but that happens basically uh, within humans and animals alike. So within the niche that actually human lifestyle is producing, uh, not only a higher density of human populations, but also a higher density of animal populations due to um, domestication, the pathogen can actually afford, so to speak, to be specialized on very specific hosts that would also live very close to each other, such as sheep, such as horses, cattle, and so forth. And this is what we can actually uh, see here through time. And we can also see an increase in pseudogenization through time, even within ancient samples. So the question is, is this only true for Salmonella enterica? Can we use similar approaches also for other pathogens? And here I would like to um, switch <clears throat> to my second example, another pathogen that I would like to introduce, although it probably doesn't um, need a lot of introduction. And I would like to talk a bit about the plague, or more precisely the plague bacterium, Yersinia pestis. So um, plague, the plague as a disease is, um, of course, certainly most well known from the uh, Black Death and what we call the second plague pandemic. So a number of outbreaks that happen in medieval Europe uh, until the early modern times um, that are following the Black Death. What we see here is uh, a contemporary seen from the uh, so-called Great Plague of Marseille in the early 18th century, one of the last great plague outbreaks in Europe in early modern times, following actually the Black Death um, in medieval times. So over multiple centuries, we have actually after the Black Death uh, plague outbreaks in, in Europe. But I would not like to talk about the medieval plague today, but rather ask the question, if we now go back to a very similar time interval um, as we did for uh, Esenterica, so basically looking at the late Neolithic, early Bronze Age, the time of the Neolithization process, do we find plague also there? And there are now an, a number of studies that have actually found that, and I would like to show you our latest collection of plague genomes from this time, also all the studies that these genomes are taken from are listed here, shown in the map and listed. And I would like um, to just give you a bit of an overview here and not talk about um, every individual genome, of course. But uh, we have by now quite a number of plague genomes from the time of uh, the late Neolithic and uh, early Bronze Age across uh, Eurasia. And you see that this is actually a, a rather large a geographic distance that the diversity of plague strains are actually covering. Um, and also we have by now uh, a notable genetic diversity. 
Uh, first of all, I would also like to say that we are covering um, multiple millennia here with plague diversity. But you see also that we have uh, different colors here on that map. And these colors are actually referring to different types of plague. And in order to introduce that, I would like to give you an overview of the phylogenetic um, tree of Yersinia pestis. So just walking you a bit through this tree, um, most of the genomes that we find in this time period of the uh, late Neolithic, early Bronze Age, actually in, into the Iron Age, are shown in purple. And this is what we see on this rather long purple branch here. However, um, by now we also know of a number of even more ancestral types of plague that are indicated here in blue. And also during similar time periods, um, another type of plague that we see here uh, shown in, in green. And what is the difference here? So first of all, the, uh, what we see here in purple, but also in blue, these early forms of uh, plague, they are lacking certain virulence factors that uh, make the plague highly transmittable by fleas. So as we know, the ecology of uh, plague in modern times is that it is actually rodent disease. It is not a human disease. So humans are an evolutionary dead end, so to speak, for the plague bacterium. It does not really sustain for uh, longer times in human populations as we know plague nowadays. And it is transmitted within these rodent reservoirs by fleas that are taking up blood from infected animals and then biting other animals and infecting these. And the bacterium has actually the ability to form a biofilm in the, in the stomach of the flea, multiplying there, and it needs a number of uh, virulence factors to be able to actually do that. Many of these virulence factors are not present in the type of plague that we see here in purple and blue. So these strains were likely not highly efficient um, in being transmitted by fleas. However, the full repertoire of uh, virulence factors is present in the strains that we see in green. So if I go back to the map, we see, however, that both types, so what we see in purple and blue, but also what we see in green, has actually a large ge a geographic expanse. Although we do not have as many uh, flea-adapted strains as we have non-flea-adapted strains, it seems that also the, the flea-adapted type spread actually across Eurasia. What can we now do to characterize these uh, strains even more from an ecological perspective? And one of the things we did is actually looking at the relationship between genetics and other factors such as time and geography. And what you see here in the upper left corner is a correlation between genetic distances of um, the uh, LMBA branch, so what we call the late Neolithic Bronze Age branch that was shown in purple, and we have calculated here all pairwise genetic distances of these Yersinia pestis genomes. And what you see on the y-axis are the temporal distances, so basically the age of these strains. And also here, we calculated all pairwise distances and we correlated these two measures with each other. And what you see here is an extremely high correlation. And what this tells us is that we have almost no parallel diversification within um, this population of Yersinia pestis strains. If I go back to the phylogeny, this is what we can also see here. So we have side branches on this lineage, but all of them are quite short. We primarily have one long branch and we do not have any kind of forking events that uh, would create sublineages that would survive on their own for a long time. So this is what we call what we would call parallel diversification, but we do not really see that. We see just one continuous lineage. And this is what is reflected in a high correlation between genetics 
and time, meaning that actually time is telling us quite precisely where on this long branch a genome will fall. What we see in the upper right is, is a correlation between genetics and geography, and we see that there is basically no uh, notable correlation at all. And this shows us that we do not have a strong phylogeographic pattern in this data. And what does this mean? This means actually that we have um, a type of plague that is highly mobile. If it would not be highly mobile, we would actually expect two things. First of all, um, that we do see parallel diversification in various parts of Europe where sublineages would basically form their own plague population that then also evolve in parallel independent of the others due to low mobility and large geographic distances. But then we would also expect to find certain plague strains in certain areas and others in other areas. And basically the geography being indicative for the type of genetics that we would see. But this is not the case. And from this, we conclude that we have actually a highly mobile type of Yersinia pestis. What this means is not clear to us. Um, we do see that plague also mirrors basically the mobility of humans. And therefore, our hypothesis is that this type of plague also moved in the connections of humans. How exactly is not clear. One possibility is actually that this ancient type of plague um, that uh, is not highly, uh, highly efficiently transmitted by fleas could have been a human disease. So there are many colleagues um, who hypothesized that, that this was actually a disease transmitted human to human and um, basically having the human populations as a reservoir. Another possibility is that the livestock that the humans lived with played a role. Um, and of course, it is still a possibility that rodent populations that might have uh, lived in the context of uh, human settlements could have played a role as well. So these are still open questions um, in this topic. But I would like to come back to an aspect that we have talked about before, and this is pseudogenization again. So the, the same analysis that we did for S. enterica, however, across the full diversity of Salmonella and enterica strains, and rather in connection um, of a correlation with host restricted and host unrestricted strains, we did here in a bit of a different way, uh, just on this branch that we see in purple through time. And this is what you see here um, on the y-axis are the genomes from this uh, Stone Age plague branch um, sorted by time. So the oldest genomes are at the bottom and the youngest ones are at the top. At the very top, we actually have a genome from the Iron Age. And what we see on the uh, x-axis is actually uh, the number of pseudogenes that were detected in these strains. And as you can see, the number of pseudogenes is actually increasing through time. And um, this leads us to the hypothesis that what we might actually see here is also an adaptation to a new ecology. And also here we hypothesize, as this is in parallel with uh, human development, that also here um, the human populations, particularly during the neolithization process with increased uh, density of human populations, but also livestock, have played a role in shaping uh, the evolutionary pattern and development of this pathogen um, as it has existed at that time. And this might then be reflected in this increased pseudogene frequency that we also see through time. So a higher specialization to a certain ecological niche. Um, however, one should also note that unlike for S. enterica, where this type of bacterium that we see in the past has actually evolved into a specialized human pathogen that we can still find today in humans um, and related forms that have specialized on animal species such as pigs. Um, and we can still find that today with this type of plague that we see here, we do not see that anymore uh, nowadays. So these um, plague strains that we see here um, 
are probably extinct, at least in the modern plague diversity, we do not see representatives of this branch. So um, a bit of a summary here for prehistoric Yersinia pestis, we find that widespread and potentially highly mobile. At least this is the pattern that we observe in Neolithic, Bronze Age, Iron Age, uh, Eurasia. We find evolutionary patterns that point to a well-connected reservoir. So this is what I meant when I described that we do not see a parallel diversification process. If we would have distinct reservoirs and very little exchange between them, we would actually expect to see that we have uh, different branches of plague developing in these two reservoirs, not necessarily different with um, their uh, ecology or phenotype, but just due to drift, so to speak, we would just expect that they also genetically uh, diverge. But we do not see that. We do not see any of these kind of long-term parallel diversification. We see one primary lineage across all Eurasia. And this points to uh, a well-connected reservoir. So either a single reservoir or many reservoirs that are, however, extremely well-connected and have exchange of uh, bacteria all the time. Um, what we do, however, see is the parallel split uh, of lineages with different ecological backgrounds. And this is the lineage, if you remember, that um, I've shown you in green, the lineage that actually does have the full set of virulence vectors for highly uh, flea-efficient um, transmission. And um, we do see that both of these types of plague coexisted uh, potentially over many millennia. And of course, these uh, second type of plague with all the virulence factors in place is also the type of plague that kept evolving that we then do see later in other plague pandemics, such as the first pandemic starting with the Justinianic plague, um, the second pandemic starting with the uh, Black Death, but also the third pandemic that uh, basically still continues nowadays as plague is an endemic pathogen in many eras, uh, in many areas of the world, just not in uh, Western Europe anymore. So with that, I would like to come uh, to the end of my talk. So this is uh, just a small collection of um, uh, review papers, but also some uh, primary research that I have basically introduced. And with that, I thank you for your attention and uh, I'm happy to have a discussion and questions from your end. Thank you.